A very good morning to all of you. <laughs> it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this morning CME on palliative medicine. And the topic will be palliative care, everybody's business. And we have a very distinguished guest amongst us, Dr. Moira Lane from Scotland. She has specialized in internal medicine and she is a leading palliative physician from Scotland. And she is a lady <coughs> with a strong ties with India. She has been coming to India for the last more than 20 years or so. And she has visited almost every state of India, <laughs> India, in India. And in fact, she had come here two years back and had made a presentation in this very same room. And on behalf of the palliative medicine department and on behalf of the entire museum's family, I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Murali. Currently, currently, she is working as the head of the palliative care Mulago Hospital and Makarela University, Kampala, Uganda. And also, she is the medical director of Caris International Palliative Care Trust. And she is also associated with the Global Health Academy, University of Edinburgh. Now, I invite Dr. Mulago to for her presentation. Good morning. Really lovely to be with you. Thank you for the incredibly warm welcome. I was here, I think I spoke two years ago, but I was here last year. And on that visit, uh, I was introducing my good friend and colleague, Dr. Titrevekit Schwellen. And of course, now she's not talking to me, which is very exciting. I'm not going to go over the basics of the introduction to palliative care. If you want to know that, I'm sorry, then the team, the team will show you. I'm wanting to just pull out some of the uh, interesting things that are happening or, or some evidence that's around for how palliative care can be everybody's business. Um, I just want to introduce the organization, that, the NGO that I represent, partly because you met my one of our trustees, the Reverend Hamilton Imbadas, who came, I think, around six months ago. He sends his greetings. Um, uh, Cardiff means friendship or fellowship. It's a Christian based NGO in the UK. And uh, it's my, my trustees wanted me to particularly greet you and say that they're very happy about this ongoing link with the CM speech. I also want to start by congratulating uh, the team. Can those who are in the palliative care team just wave that to me and just for recognition? Lovely, thank you. Excellent. So in the last two years, they've done a huge amount. They have increased their inpatient and outpatient numbers, but not just numbers, it's actually about quality. And sometimes you can spend a lot of time, as you know, with one or two patients and their families. Uh, I had the privilege of doing a ward round yesterday and seeing that firsthand. I also was seeing really excellent referrals coming from many departments. So thank you for that um, joint working that I can see happening here at BCMCH. The home visit numbers have really come up, and that's such an important part of, of caring for people. Um, we saw someone yesterday who wanted to know that if they went home, they could phone someone. If they were in trouble, somebody could visit, and if they needed inpatient care, that could happen again. That's an important part of the care here. I was also impressed to see some initiatives. Uh, Mr. Shelby, you're here. The, the work you're doing with ICU is fantastic and really it's a little, a little unique. So I know we've discussed how you can present that and, uh, as research, but thank you for the work you're doing to bring that into ICU. Yes. And there's some particular links with departments. I haven't listed all of them. Many of you are linking, but I was really interested having just come from a national neuro neurology and palliative care meeting in India to see the very strong links, for example, with stroke disease and how that is working. And I think uh, our young resident, where is she now? She, there she is, lovely. You're going to be looking at that from a research point of view as well. Can I congratulate the team too for their role in contributing to the Clinical Ethics Committee, uh, Dr. Lita, for their role in the Stanford University Quality Improvement Program, um, one of only three settings in Kerala. And also, this is very exciting, this ICM our care grant for advanced research for the very first time has gone to a palliative care topic and it has gone uh, with, led by uh, Professor Chitra um, to look at mental health and palliative care in rural hospitals. And that's the first one, so I think that's another round of applause. 
looking forward, um, there's going to be something called the Essentials. The Indian Association for Palliative Care Essentials course is going to start, I think, November. Please look out for that. It's just a few days and then some work and then a contact session. So it's a relatively small amount of time, but that if, if everybody in the hospital can be routinely doing that essentials course, we can really start to, to make this everybody's business in BCMCH. And we're also discussing with Dr. Chandi how we can develop uh, leadership training. If Sister Minnie is here, she'll be very happy with that too. Okay, so congratulations. Our goal is integrated palliative care. Seeing palliative care is not just done by somebody like myself, who has had the privilege of being a specialist in this area for more than 25 years, but actually seeing it as competencies that we all need to have, not just actually in health and social care. Um, I think we have some students with us this morning. You're very welcome. Um, but we also want to look at our communities and families. And um, we to just give you snapshots from different places, many of them from other parts of the world where I have the privilege of working and visiting. But we need to think, how can we help our, our communities, our families, our health, our social care systems to be able to naturally do holistic care where they are? Um, I just spoke to mum from dermatology. She's maybe just stepped out. And she was just telling me just how much she practices palliative care when she has complex uh, problems like chronic psoriasis, with the stigma and the um, self-image and the chronic disease issues. It's part and parcel of so much. And the reason I specialized in palliative care, I was doing respiratory medicine and HIV care, was because I realized I was missing some of these competencies. I went to train in them and then fell in love with the specialty. So we're looking at quality of life, reducing suffering, restoring dignity, and bringing that holistic care back into medicine uh, that used to be there, but got a bit squashed out by biomedical models. I have a good friend, Professor Scott Murray, who was just retired from being the first professor of primary palliative care. And this is uh, what he always wanted to talk about. All illnesses, all times, all diseases, all settings, all nations. Um, it's a nice way just to think of who needs palliative care. Of course, this means that Everybody needs to be involved in delivering it. And you need to know when to ask for those with, with specialty skills. And it's great that you have a team in this hospital that can support you in that way. This is a graph, it's an interesting graph from work from uh, Scott Murray and his team, which showed how uh, different parts of the holistic spectrum changed as the disease progressed. And what's interesting about this is you see in this particular patient, this was someone with cancer, you saw the decline in physical and social issues, but you saw a very wavy pattern in, in psychological and spiritual issues as people um, faced difficult trauma, grief and loss, came to terms with it in some way, found some meaning and purpose, dipped again. So again, it just shows how it's not just about end of life care. You know, there's a lot of particularly psychosocial and um, spiritual needs earlier in a person's illness. And I think when we look at some of our low and middle income countries, the financial aspects would be very high. I think you've seen this. I just put it up, it's just two slides to summarize. This is something I certainly showed you before. I think other colleagues have. The size of the country on this map relates to the amount of access to pain relief. Okay. Any comments about that map when you look at it? Yeah. We're missing quite a lot of places, eh? We're missing most of Asia. India is hardly appearing, yeah, despite how many? 1.4 billion people now, yeah? Uh, Africa is really struggling, South America. So of course there are problems in some parts of the world, maybe with overuse, or actually I think it's more social problems compounded by health system problems in places like the US. But most of my time is spent working in places where it's very, very difficult to access. And again, it's great that that routine access to oral morphine, at least, and I think some of the more expensive formulations is available in this hospital. Someone took that map uh, a few months ago, this is a new, newish diagram, and tried to, to extrapolate, try to look forward and see what's going to happen with this concept that has been brought up by the Lancet Commission of serious health-related suffering. 
So this is the new concept we're trying to test out. And you can see, um, other than really most of the low and the, sorry, the upper middle and the lower middle income countries would expect a huge increase in uh, serious health related suffering, which relates mostly to chronic disease, but also an overlap in many countries with infectious disease. We only have to look at the, I listened this morning to the news and it was all about coronavirus. Palliative care is about the whole person and the whole team. So whoever you are in this room, you have a role in palliative care for sure. Okay, the first two rows have those who have taken it on as their majority role, but you all have a role. And the team are really keen to start this essentials course, um, partly to really skill up everyone and be able to implement this in their practice. And we sit within the family and community context, but also within the context of our culture, our faith, our environment, and uh, the unit in Edinburgh we're looking at, planetary health, and how planetary health and chronic disease are actually quite closely linked. And we need to not just think of only the person, but also the environment. I mentioned a few diagnoses there, they're just a few, but it's relevant to many, many different diseases and across the age spectrum. Perhaps some of the biggest challenges uh, for the neurology departments and psychiatry departments are dementia, increasing numbers of dementia. But we mustn't forget the neonates and the children and the various vulnerable groups in between, which will be unique to your setting and your area of work. So what are some of the challenges? I'm just going to share a little bit, for example, about oncology. I know we have oncologists with us. Thank you for being here. So the US have been doing a lot of work because palliative care in the US was unfortunately rather determined by insurance and was only being used at the end of life. So the oncologists there looked at early palliative care and they have a number of trials you can look up, but they've showed definite improvement in quality of life improvement in several psycho psychological indicators, particularly depression, and also um, issues around communication and coping um, and goals of care discussion. And I know you've had some excellent communication skills training here. This isn't very clear, you don't have to read all of it. I'm just going to try and indicate some of what you can see here. This is, the, the, this is a randomized trial, go and look it up if you want. But most people were coming for either symptom control or for help with coping. It's quite a general term, isn't it? But if some of you are thinking, why should I refer to the team? Pain is very obvious, a difficult symptom. Most of it you can manage in your own setting. Sometimes you need help from the team. But this issue of coping and of illness understanding and building a rapport is actually vital if we're going to offer holistic care. Shelty, I think that's particularly what you're doing in uh, Sister Shelty in, I, in ICU. But this bottom one right, uh, you see the grey and the burgundy colour and the blue, this is what that coping discussion was about, redirecting hope. You know, not destroying hope, but maybe hoping for something a little different now that we know the reality of the situation. Changing our goals of, of, um, our goals of care, helping people learn coping skills that maybe they didn't know, or building resilience in people who have been uh, just struggling to adjust to their illness. And issues around behavioral coping and spiritual coping. These are some of the things that the team can do, but they can also help you do in your settings. So if you're wondering why to refer, these are some of the research evidence. And I think we should really support our colleagues who are working in other departments. We're reading this quote, and I'm going to ask you where you think it's from. Okay, it's spoken by an oncologist, it's part of a research. We live in an environment where there's a lot of stress or demand from the family. Once a patient comes, they expect treatment. Bouncing them back home, they feel it's very, very unfair not to get treatment. Where do you think that quote is from? Any suggestions? Does it sound familiar? A little familiar? This is from my hospital in Uganda. So this is a problem all over. And it's a problem because colleagues like our oncology colleagues are having people come up feeling quite desperate. Please give me some treatment. It's very hard to say we don't have treatment. We did a role play with senior neurologists two days ago at this conference. And the patient kept saying, am I going to be cured? Even where was she from? She was from 
from Chennai. Very senior colleagues struggled even in a role play to answer that question. They're difficult questions. Yeah. Let me just show you some of the evidence from an audit that our oncologist asked us to do with them in Uganda. And we used the indicator of people having chemotherapy right at the end of life, because that's, that is used in a number of settings as a trigger to a critical incident review. Of course, something might happen like a, a myocardial event or a stroke that changes the, the illness trajectory. But if routinely chemotherapy has been given very close to the end of life, in most settings, that's a critical incident review to make you think, do we need to look at our systems? And this is our Ugandan figures. And they're quite serious. Most of the international research suggests your figure should be somewhere around 20% in the last uh, month of life. And you can see it was 87% within 60 days in our settings. And that reflected a national hospital, people coming from afar, and almost certainly also a lack of real integration with palliative care so that we can help with those redirecting of hope and changing in coping discussions. It doesn't all have to fall on one person's shoulders. In this study, the more unwell you were, the more likely you were to get chemotherapy. I think that reflected some desperation on all sides and uh, that's where we need to work together to support our colleagues and our patients. It was also interesting that they really loved the palliative care team and they thought they were referring extremely well to the palliative care team, but actually they weren't. So they thought they were referring people who had at least one month, but actually it was only five days on average. So you can see just those perceptions that we need to look and use research to, and audits to help us improve. This is from neurology. It's actually a chronic neurological illness. I think this one was MND. But you can see that the, uh, actually I think it was MS, you can see that the discussions about goal setting and what that meant for treatment were really only happening right at the end. In fact, they were happening after cognitive decline. Um, so it's a challenge, isn't it? When do we have these discussions? Um, how can we do them? And also, so that's what you've been doing in ICU, helping people have these discussions and make proper goals of care. And I like this checklist. This has been drawn up by an international group of neurologists Neurology is one of the areas, one of the many areas where we see a lot of chronic disease and palliative care need. There's about to be a new neurological society uh, started, um, I think, in India with US partners for palliative care. I like this, a checklist. Does the patient have pain or distressing symptoms? Does the patient or family need social support or help with coping? We might add spiritual support into that. Do we need to readdress goals of care or adjust treatment according to patient-centered goals. Of course, we can only adjust treatment to patient-centered goals if we know what those goals are. And lastly, what needs to be done today. These are quite helpful. This is a checklist that is now recommended for use by neurologists and um, when they're thinking of how to integrate palliative care. Ahmed is a little boy that I've met in Gaza City. Uh, I'll be going to Gaza again next week. And I think those of you reading the news, you can see um, even more trouble in Gaza. It's very hard to live in Gaza. This little boy has leukemia. Um, he has to, he has had treatment, but to get treatment, he has to leave Gaza. And that means leaving his family. I asked him how many days, he said 94. I think he had counted every single day. His parents aren't allowed to travel with him. That's part of the political, very, very unpleasant rules. Please do pray for that part of the world. Um, and this is a group of medical students, and we're doing a word round. And what was absolutely lovely was that Ahmed was the teacher this day. He was telling them about how it felt to leave, how he had coped with his leukemia, the help he had got. There's a brand new palliative care team in this pediatric hospital in Gaza who are really trying hard in the circumstances they're in to make a difference for these children's lives. And then he said to the medical students, I wonder if I'm going to die. Can you imagine the feeling of everybody on that word round? All the medical students in tears. But we managed to have that conversation, listen to him, but also found out that his favorite football team was Manchester United and that he wanted to be a doctor one day. Those kind of holistic conversations and care. And the role of palliative care in hemato oncology. You have a new hemato oncology service coming up, which is fantastic. Please do remember to also integrate palliative care into those programs. Simon is a patient, I just won't read the whole story, but we looked after in Uganda. But I want to just look at the contrast between the first one. 
he was talking about suffering without meaning, hopelessness. This was a deeply uh, um, Christian man. His faith was very important to him, but he really was struggling. And then he talks about the help he got, which is about pain control, but also about encouragement and listening and talking. And I love this comment at the end. The palliative care he's got has helped him to, to know that God still cares for him. What a privilege, isn't it, to be able to reach out to people and for them to see in us that God is still caring for them. There are many hidden people in the scenario. You know the ones in your city. Do you know who's sitting on that chair? Can you see? I'll give you a clue. She's sitting on the front row. <laughs> so this is a home visit. I think this was a mother whose adult son had chronic schizophrenia and had been quite agitated. No one had been sleeping. It was worries about self-harm. Um, and with expert psychological and psych psychiatric input, uh, the symptoms were less. But actually, what was important was the community and the family also um, understanding and coming together and dealing with the stigma to help. And you see, I've just come from Manipur, uh, where, of course, substance use is a huge issue. You sit in Imphal and you see the, the hills above, and they're all with coffee plantations, illegal. Very difficult, isn't it? My colleague went to Alnacho recently, the same. In Mizoram, we see um, very tight church structures and huge numbers of people with uh, substance use, TB, HIV. It's a big challenge. And we need to be with people for the long term in these sorts of situations. Spirituality. Uh, you heard uh, Reverend Imbadas speak. He's also Dr. Imbadas because he's done his PhD looking at spiritual issues in Tamil populations. This was a piece of work done in Uganda and um, looking at the narrative, the discussion that we have with people, how that can be a spiritual support tool. We know that things like praying and reading scripture, you have beautiful verses here that I love. But actually the act of listening and just exploring meaning and purpose and hope and forgiveness, those are all components of our spirituality, our connectedness not just expressed in faith terms. And this was a lovely piece of work, bringing out some key themes from those narrative discussions. Another specialty, I have a lovely colleague who's now uh, leading our department in Uganda, and she was an internal medicine graduate and chose to do her um, thesis for palliative care, the first palliative care PhD in our unit, looking at heart failure. Very interesting again, looking at long, longitudinal study patients with heart failure. And how their problems are very similar to those with cancer, but actually we're getting much less support. And with the team yesterday, we saw just such patients with an ejection fraction of, I think, 20%. And the cardiologist has done a great job, and the primary team in helping that family understand, and the palliative care team were part of the goal setting. Some work from rural India. I think you will know the Emmanuel Hospital Association. Many of you will have visited, some of your students go to EHA hospitals, which is great. That's such a great initiative you do here at BCMCH University. So they've done some work, and colleagues also are doing this in Malawi, trying to see if having these goals of care discussions early, if helping people understand more of what's happening will stop them selling all they have to get to the nearest cancer center. In, in Uganda, they might sell their cows and take their children out of school. And in this study in North India, they used palliative care to help people understand their rights, what was available for them, to stop them spending money on futile treatments to make better choices for them and their families. And they were able to show in quite an early study, quite significant improvement in poverty. Chronic disease pushes people into poverty. I know Tirvala itself, this is maybe not the biggest issue, but you are linking with parts of the country which is certainly is a big issue. So congratulations to HA, and I know they're continuing this work. And don't forget that the people who can actually speak on our behalf are also our patients, or our stakeholders, as some people call them. This is a young woman who has a complex multi-system disease who decided to become an advocate. The World Hospice Palliative Care Association supported and promoted that. And she now has the ear of Dr. Tedros, who's the head of WHO. He's come to meet her, and he calls her when he wants to ask her some questions about palliative care. And that's done a huge amount for her sense of dignity and value. It's also more effective than all the papers we write for the WHO. 
And there's some work saying that although research is continuing, this is, if you're interested in research, there is lots to do in palliative care in all of your settings. A lot of research may need to be done, particularly interventional studies that will inform our, our um, policy makers. And I, I'm excited very much about the grant that you have to look at that in mental health. And this is a review, a recent review, showing that we need to do more to prove to our policy makers what, what is needed. It's not a piece of research. We participated in this from Uganda, where we looked at the three-step. You're familiar with the three-step ladder, mild, moderate, severe pain, non-opioids, adjuvant, second step, uh, opioids like tramadol and adjuvants, and third step, morphine. We were only using two steps in Uganda because tramadol is too expensive for us. Um, and actually, in many settings, we're doing the same. So this was tested out. Big study, Europe, uh, Latin America, and Africa. There wasn't an Indian site because of getting ethics approval. It was too difficult. Next time, we'll involve you guys here. And this showed that using two-step or three-step worked. Both modes led to pain control. But if you used a two-step approach, you saved time, particularly 50% of those on the three-step approach needed to move to that third step. So an extra hospital visit, an extra prescription, an extra assessment. And um, so the economics were heavily in favor of two-step um, and the pain control was much the same. This will be published quite soon, I think, in the Lancet. Curricular integration. This has to happen at um, MD, postgraduate levels across the way, all healthcare, undergraduate and postgraduate. I just pulled this out because it's new. You've already got a very innovative curriculum, so congratulations for that. But this is going to be very interesting rolling out across India for the very first time communication skills and some of the ethical values that underpin all of our practice, but definitely the palliative care components are going to be at the heart of the curriculum. The question is, how will this be taught and who will it be taught? So we'll need to make sure that we take this opportunity, which only comes around once every how many years? 20, 30 years, the MCI revises its curriculum and really do this well. But it's a lovely opportunity to teach. Look at these uh, values that they're wanting to teach. Altruism is something you've been focusing on here, isn't it? But also teamwork, respect, sensitivity to differences, communication skills, and so on. Fantastic opportunity. I went to Gaza, and um, as I said, I was teaching the students, got to the end of the session, and end of the four days, and I just said to them, what things have you been learning? And they, they had fun, they wrote on the wall with whiteboards, and they were youngsters, so they were writing uh, quite fun things. But this one stood out to me, humanity until infinity. Now remember, this is a situation where actually inhumanity is the order of the day from the political input, yeah? There's a young man, a medical student fourth year, and it's a bit like a superhero uh, call, <laughs> but I, it's, it's still making me think. What does humanity until infinity mean in our cultural, political, faith context? They also told the other things we should deal with patients not only with our brain, but also with our hearts. And when they said this, look at all these lovely young girls demonstrating exactly what they meant with emoji style. What does humanity mean? I'm going to think about that in more than a minute. But, but we do have to mobilize our communities. We also have to challenge when things are not being done as they should be. Where in our societies is there inhumanity? Where do we need to challenge that? Not just through palliative care, but what I love about palliative care is it allows us to challenge that, right? Quite obviously, because we're talking about hope and life and death and meaning and purpose, it comes in at that level, values level. Let me just show you these things. This is uh, evidence of great community mobilization. This is a cancer walk in Delhi, run by the biggest uh, palliative care program, Can Support. Um, which is run every year. Here's Palim India, who do a lot of work with differently abled uh, population. And this is um, a beach outing every year. This is the first Students Association for Palliative Care Conference. I know you guys are already involved in many ways, but you can think of coming formally involved with this. We saw students coming all the way to Bahati to take part in our conference. Uh, and I have to say they, the level of enthusiasm and energy was fantastic. I think today, there's a rollout of engineering colleges in Kerala taking on board palliative care. Fascinating to really mobilizing the youngsters, the next generation, to come up with innovative ideas. Some of these engineering students have been helping design uh, aids for the differently able, for example. 
And where is this from? If I got this right. Did, it, did I get this wrong? I think it was here itself, wasn't it? During the floods, we were only medical students and others mobilized to respond to the needs. So we need to really get hold of this next generation, get them excited and enthused and involved. I want to just touch on humanitarian issues. It's an area close to, to my heart, and I know others in this audience. Um, we've been looking at what are the chronic disease and the palliative care needs in this population with a number of colleagues, people working with Rohingya people, uh, colleagues uh, that was the after effects of the Nepal earthquake, of course, yourselves here in Kamala with the, the, the floods, two years of floods, but also some of the parts of the world affected by conflict and war. We have new guidelines from uh, Sphere. Sphere is like the sort of standardized book for humanitarian agencies asking for chronic disease and end of life care um, input, but they don't know how to do it yet. We've just been part of writing a book to help teach humanitarian workers. And um, we have a WHO guideline, we have some Lancet articles and a review and a letter that some of us wrote recently about uh, the issues in Palestine. So this is an interesting area and I think it's something you can also contribute to with your experience and looking forward. And here's some of the, the work that was shared in Guwahati just recently. We had the first conference on humanitarian palliative care for the Indian Association. Colleagues from Anakalan district shared some of the work they did. Um, which was really quite, quite not, not quite impressive, hugely impressive. These are young doctors going out really to very rural areas. Uh, I know you did the same here, and I spoke to, was it Dr. Ibo yesterday? Is he here this morning? I can't see him. So you have a huge amount of experience to also contribute to that discussion. We also had the BSF join us for that conference. Interesting, isn't it? Having the military come, we have a doctor in palliative care who is a BSF member. She's fantastic, Dr. Savita Patula. She got her command, commandant to come to our Guwahati meeting, and we made a very different meeting from normal. But he was also reminding us of the very important role that the BSF have, particularly in some of those border areas like Assam. This is now South Sudanese refugees in Uganda. Uh, we've been working for a while with fantastic colleagues in areas where you have one-to-one, 240,000 people living there and 260,000 refugees. Without much in the way of trouble, I think I told you before, moving around freely, uh, Chitra was part of the group when we looked at their needs assessment, including mental health. We're helping a young man do a, a pain assessment score here. Sorry, you can't see that very well. This is a, a woman who's looking after her friend's friend who has cancer. I think a woman, very elegant, very dignified, but really the trauma is difficult to imagine. This is, sorry, they're not coming up correctly. One of the nurses doing that study. This volunteer said to me when I, I was taking his feedback, he helped us identify patients. We particularly found an excess of chronic pain and trauma, which we're now going to look at in more depth. But he said this, I'm human, by the way. Just, you know, I'm human, by the way. Just, can you remember that? Same sort of idea coming up. How do we really recognize and value humanity? We also train caregivers. Uh, this is a tribal setting, um, but it was very interesting. They were almost overwhelmed by getting trained. Some of them actually, you can see that last one. I'd like to apologize to my father, because if I knew now what I, what I knew, if I knew then what I know now, I would have done it differently. So let's, let's actually empower our family caregivers in our community. Let's empower our faith groups. This is my church in Kampala. They have a team called the Samu team. Their tagline is bringing joy, bringing hope. And they are going in, linking in with the medical teams, but going in as a church-based team, but well-trained and linked in to the hospital system so that they've been trained in listening skills and communication skills and how to support pastorally. And this is Manipur. This is a, a professor of theology who has gone back to his, his native place in Manipur, the Kukri tribe people, and is linking indigenous wisdom, which was his PhD topic, and his Christian faith. And um, he particularly said palliative care, end of life care, that is part of indigenous wisdom. And that was us teaching in their traditional hat. They are just north of Kufa. So just to finish the last couple of slides, this is uh, in Fort Kochi. A reminder, just again, of that issue of humanity. And um, one of the quotes that the psychosocial qualitative work that I think you're doing, the patient said, I have seen that God's own country really is God's own country mm -hmm. because of the way that they responded. This is about hope and humanity. 
the letter we wrote for the Lancet was reflecting on the inhumanity of situations like uh, the Palestinian space and thinking that actually how we respond to suffering, how we how our compassionate response is hugely important and how palliative care has a role, not palliative care just done by me, but palliative care done by all of us in upholding dignity and easing suffering and in speaking very loudly about how human that person in front of me is. And of course, in humanity, we think of people made in the image of God, valuable, not for what we make them, but for who they are. And I'll finish with this. This young man was our young doctor who looked after us during our time in Gaza. His mum, uh, besides, said, I, told, I tell Angel every morning, just because you're a doctor, please don't forget that you are human. You look at every patient as if they're me. You treat everyone like your mum. And he's a lovely young doctor. I think he's had as much training from his mum <laughs> as he's had from medical school. And I asked these students, what are the values that you see? These are the ones that said this humanity into divinity. Can you read them? Love, compassion, hope, mercy, honesty, justice, humanity, joy, dignity, respect. I have to say, I was very humble reading that and listening to it. And my colleague next to me said, those are like the fruits of the spirit, many of them. And this, what a privilege it is, is to talk at this level with these youngsters in such a difficult situation, but actually anywhere that we have the privilege of working and um, practicing. So that was a quick run through. I hope it was helpful. Uh, time is up. But I wanted to just give you snapshots of the ways in which palliative care is everybody's business and the ways in which we can, um, through the way we offer care, through the way we empower others in the community, in the students, in the families, actually uh, say something about the value of each person. And I think at that point I will finish. Thank you very much. <laughs>